following video is a very brief examination of the development of the concept of Bushido. It is based on a presentation I had created for Anime North 2020, which was cancelled due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Anime North instead opted to host an online streaming event in late July of the same year, and so I retooled the presentation for that event. The original presentation was to be an hour long, however, Owing to a 30 minute time limit, a lot of the material had to be removed or whittled down to be as concise as possible. This video then, will serve as a quick and dirty introduction into a much broader examination of the topic of Bushido, with subsequent videos going into much greater detail about the various historic periods, figures, texts, and related topics featured in the video you are about to watch. With that in mind, I hope you enjoy it, and as always, if you have any questions, please leave them for me in the comments. I'd like you to watch the following clip. It's from the 2003 film, The Last Samurai. I'll be discussing why a film from 2003 is still relevant in a little bit, but for now, I want you to pay attention to what is being said by Ken Watanabe and what is being heard by Tom Cruise. You have seen many things. I have. You do not fear death, but sometimes you wish for it. Is this not so? Yes, I hope so. It happens to men who have seen what we have seen. And then, I come to this place of my ancestors. I never remember like these poor selves. We are all dying. To know life in every breath, every cup of tea, every life we take, the way of the warrior. Life in every breath. That is. Bushido. Samurai Ideology Bushido Part 1. What is Bushido? Etymologically, the roots for the word Bushido are formed by the characters for war, Bu, gentleman, Shi, and Wei, Do. The term is commonly translated into English as the way of the warrior, or, if we are more culturally specific, the way of the samurai. In so much as popular media goes, Bushido has long been understood to have been the guiding principle, the dominant ideology, if you will, of the samurai class of medieval and early modern Japan. This could also be extended beyond this time frame to include the 20th century and even up to the present day. But what does Bushido entail? What does the way of the warrior actually mean? Was it some kind of codified set of behaviors? Was it a more loosely defined ethos which was never really written down, but was nevertheless instrumental in providing moral and behavioral instruction to samurai? Or was it, perhaps, something else entirely? Well, this is precisely what we'll be exploring for the next half hour. So let's get started. Part 2 Before Bushido Attempting to cover the vast sweep of what is often considered samurai history, a span of roughly 700 years, is well beyond the scope of a 30 minute video. As such, this will be a very brief overview of some important developments which contributed to the formation of the samurai as a distinct and dominant class during the medieval and early modern periods of Japanese history. The Heian Period, 794 to 1185. Formally, the term samurai would not become the official designation for a class of professional warriors until the 14th century. And so in earlier periods, the most common term used was Bushi. This, as I've already shown, is one of the roots of Bushido. There were other associated terms as well. 
Mononofu, Suamono, Musha, and a Saburai. The latter would be the basis for the term Samurai. Bushi were distinguished primarily because they were essentially mercenaries who would hire out their services to the nobility and because they primarily fought from horseback with bows. In fact, an early medieval literary convention held that the ethos of Bushi was Cuba no Michi, the way of the horse and bow. What specifically this entailed is difficult to pin down, but what is clear is that it was not any sort of code of behavior or ethics. The term essentially came to distinguish Bushi as men of action. The Kamakura period, 1185 to 1333. While the actual history is much more complex, traditionally, the Kamakura period marked the beginning of the age of the samurai. This tendency is primarily because of the establishment of the first shogunate, the Kamakura Bakufu, under Minamoto no Yoritomo. One of the most significant developments in the period was the concerted efforts of Yoritomo to establish some sense of class consciousness among the bushi. He accomplished this by hosting hunting parties and archery tournaments. The other significant development was the creation of the Gokenin, literally, housemen. These were bushi and their associated houses, who would become the vassals of the Kamakura Bakufu and, in times of peace, perform guard duty at the imperial court and Kamakura itself. However, despite being vassals, their identity hinged on their ability to act autonomously and this was enshrined in practice, if not law, by the concept of Jiriki Kyusai, or self-redress. This principle allowed for Bushi to settle disputes through personal violence instead of litigation through the shogunate or affiliated authorities. Autonomy was a core value of medieval Bushi. The Muromachi period 1336 to 1573. The establishment of the Ashikaga Shogunate in 1336, after prolonged civil war, was a sign of what was to come. The period was marked with civil unrest, rebellions, and war. The years 1467 to 1573 are commonly called the Sengoku Jidai, or Warring States period which saw power fracture among competing daimyo. One measure that was enacted to ensure the continuity of a bushi household in such a tumultuous period was the establishment of kakun, or house precepts. These were usually behavioral guidelines by which an individual or members of a household should govern themselves. Given the endemic nature of warfare of the period, the idea of geku kujo, or the lower overthrowing the higher, was a common one. As it turns out, undying loyalty to a lord was often pegged to the fortunes of any given battle. Samurai, and this is the period where the term came to supplant Bushi as the warrior's nom de plume, valued competency and preparedness. So if you were unskilled enough to allow yourself to be betrayed, you deserved what was coming to you. On the other hand, Owing to the need for daimyo to maintain order and increasingly fragile alliances, the principle of equal guilt, kenka ryo sebe, was used to suppress the settling of personal grudges. In this case, each person party to the quarrel was equally guilty, regardless of justification. The autonomy of the samurai, which was so important to them in periods past, began to wane as more and more power was centralized in fewer and fewer daimyo. The Azuchi Momoyama period, 1573-1603 The state of endless civil war was brought to an end by Toyotomi Hideyoshi, who became the de facto military dictator of Japan in 1573. Hideyoshi consolidated a rigid, hierarchical structure of samurai rank and this would be the foundational structure of the samurai until their dissolution in the 19th century. He further delineated the samurai as a distinct and dominant social class, 
by confiscating all non-samurai weaponry bows, swords, firearms, cannon, etc. through his sword hunts, the katana gatari. Samurai landholders also had to give up their claim to land in exchange for the right to wear swords, maintain their class identity, and receive a stipend. But once again, the distinction between the samurai and the lower classes, the non-samurai classes, was structurally and rigidly reinforced. The Edo period, 1603 to 1868. Following the death of Hideyoshi in 1598, civil war between the forces of Tokugawa Iyasu and Hideyoshi's heir resulted in a Tokugawa victory and the establishment of the third and final shogunate, the Tokugawa Bakufu. The peace, or Pax Tokugawa, lasted for over 250 years. And Japan would not see large-scale warfare again until the very end of the period. Samurai, whose class identity and superiority had been predicated on their martial prowess, suddenly found themselves in an existential crisis. What justification did Samurai have to rule when there were no more wars to fight? It is unsurprising then that this period saw an explosion of introspective treatises and texts which sought all manner of philosophical and spiritual argument to continue to justify the rule of the samurai. Texts which would later become part of the so-called Bushido canon, texts like Goden no Sho, Hagakure, Budo Shinsho, Heiho Kadensho, and so on, were all written during this period. Few of them however, talked about something called Bushido. What's more, the primary source of ethics and behavioral standards were not the heroic exploits of Bushi from earlier eras, nor even the corpus of house precepts, the kakun I had mentioned briefly earlier. Rather, ethics were dominated by Confucian and Neo-Confucian scholars, and their paragons of virtue were not ancient samurai or medieval heroes, but the sages and emperors from ancient Chinese history. This suited the Tokugawa Bakufu just fine. Confucianism advocated for virtues like loyalty, filial piety, obedience to one's social superiors, and commitment to stability and order. Just the sort of values a state bureaucracy would want to foster to maintain their hegemonic control especially over a class whose identity was tied up in their ability to act independently. Ironically, for Bushido to come to the fore, it would have to wait for the end of the Edo period, and the end of the Samurai. Part 3. Bushido Following the events of the Meiji Restoration in 1868, the Tokugawa Bakufu was overthrown and direct imperial rule was restored. Through the following decades, in an effort to modernize and industrialize the Japanese state as quickly as possible, a complete restructuring of society occurred. Spurred on by encroaching Western imperialist powers and the collapse of Chinese hegemony in East Asia, Japan was highly motivated to modernize as rapidly as possible. The samurai as a class gradually had their privileges revoked over the course of the 1870s, and by 1879, the samurai as a recognized class was abolished, bringing the age of the samurai to an end. Rebellions throughout the decade and a general resentment from the non-samurai classes towards their former social superiors fermented negative feelings about samurai through the 1870s and 80s. Emboldened by the imperialist ambitions of western states, the early decades of the Meiji period saw urban Japanese citizens become enamored with western culture. The most important figure regarding the development of Bushido in the period before the Sino-Japanese War which took place in 1885, was Ozaki Yukio, one of the most important politicians of the era and member of the Shizoku class, composed of former samurai. 
Ozaki based the idea on reforming the image of the samurai, the bushi, as a national ethic because he was heavily influenced by the English concept of the gentleman, itself held to be based on medieval chivalry. Ozaki stressed six martial virtues, frankness, bold thriftiness, courage, quick-mindedness, generosity, and liveliness. However, as pro-Western sentiment waned and nationalistic fervor erupted following the Japanese victory in the Sino-Japanese War, Ozaki's very peaceable, very pacifistic version of Bushido also fell by the wayside. As more and more Japanese intellectuals and citizens in general began to become disenchanted with the West, some turned to an idealized version of the samurai as a figure of nationalistic significance. The idealized image of the samurai served as an effective symbol of loyalty, honor, and willingness to sacrifice for the state. The spirit was then inculcated in the citizenry of Japan through educational reforms and policies. Many ideologues who saw value in the image of the samurai would make a case that following the events of 1868, the spirit of the samurai infused the whole of the Japanese nation, and the samuraiification of the country was already underway. Post-1885, and arguably in Bushido discourse overall, the most important figure was the intellectual Inoue Tetsujiro, who stressed ultra-nationalism, militarism, Yamato Dameshi, the unique and special Japanese spirit, and the centrality of Yamaga Soko as the primary source of Bushido in Japanese history. Popular historic events such as the Ako incident, also known as the 47 Ronin, were reframed to emphasize the role of the emperor and credited Soko as the teacher of the Ronin, also known as the Gishi. Uh, this despite a lack of evidence of Soko's involvement, or the Emperor at all. The victory of the Japanese military in both the First Sino-Japanese War and the Russo-Japanese War from 1904 to 1905 was used as proof of the superiority of the Japanese nation, each victory leading to respective spikes in interest in Bushido, the so-called Bushido Boons. Fundamentally, the idea of Bushido as the framework which underpinned the behavior of the samurai from the medieval to the early modern period can best be understood as an invented tradition. It was utilized to foster a sense of nationalistic solidarity and social cohesion among Japanese citizenry during an era of unparalleled social and economic upheaval. The necessity of the state to inculcate an identity of what it meant to be Japanese and to instill a willingness to sacrifice for the state and the emperor was perhaps the most lasting legacy of Bushido in the Meiji era. While the death of Emperor Meiji in 1912 saw a significant drop in popular interest in the Taisho period 1912 to 1926, Bushido would emerge again and flourish during the early to mid Showa era. 1926 to 1989. The following quote taken from a pamphlet titled The Invention of a New Religion, which was written in 1912 by Basil Hall Chamberlain, a professor of Japanese at Tokyo University from 1886 to 1890, is quite salient. As for Bushido, so modern a thing is it that neither Kempfer, Siebold, Sato, nor Rain all men knowing their Japan by heart, ever once allude to it in their voluminous writings. The cause of their silence is not far to seek. Bushido was unknown until a decade or two ago. The very word appears in no dictionary, native or foreign, before the year 1900. Chivalrous individuals of course existed in Japan, as in all countries at every period, but Bushido, as an institution or a code of rules, has never existed. Part 4 Sources of Bushido 
I'm going to shift gears a bit and now turn my attention to modern Western representations of Bushido by briefly discussing two of the most important texts on the subject in North America. Bushido, the soul of Japan. Written by Nitobe Inazo and published in English in 1900, the text examined what Inazo called Bushido, a set of behavioral values which imbued the people of Japan based on an unwritten but orally transmitted code of samurai behavior. So uncommon a term was Bushido at the turn of the century, Nitobe believed he had actually coined it himself. The text was published in English and then translated into Japanese in 1906. Written with a European audience in mind, it used an idealized version of chivalry which was in vogue in England at the time to explain the similarities between Japan and Europe. Following the Japanese victory in the Russo-Japanese War in 1905, interest in Japanese culture spiked and the book became an international bestseller. Nitobe's work was not popular within Japan at the time of its publication, as it was outside of the primary Bushido discourse I discussed above. Ironically, it wasn't until the post-war era that Nitobe's book, primarily through its impact in the US and Europe, became popular enough in Japan that he was featured on the 5,000 yen banknote from 1984 to 2004. Nitobe's version of Bushido remains almost the de facto Bushido today. Perhaps most relevant, Nitobe's text is the source of the widely popular concept of the seven virtues of Bushido. The other text which has had a significant cultural impact on the idea of Bushido in the West is the book Hagakure Kikigaki, or Dictation Given Hidden by Leaves. Hagakure was written by Yamamoto Sunetomo, also known as Jocho, in 1716 and is first and foremost a polemic against what Jocho felt was the degenerate state of the samurai of the 18th century. This text is perhaps most famous for the following passage, from Book 1, Section 2. The way of the warrior is to be found in dying. If one is faced with two options of life or death, simply settle for death. It is not an especially difficult choice. Just go forth and meet it confidently. To declare that dying without aiming for the right purpose is nothing more than a dog's death is the timid and shallow way of Kamigata warriors. Whenever faced with the choice of life and death, there is no need to try and achieve one's aims. Human beings have a preference for life. As such, it is a natural tendency to apply logic to one's proclivity to stay alive. If you miss the mark and you live to tell the tale, then you are a coward. This is a perilous way of thinking. If you make a mistake and die in the process, you may be thought of as mad, but it will not bring shame. This is the mindset of one who firmly lives in the martial way. Rehearse your death every morning and night. Only when you constantly live as though already a corpse will you be able to find freedom in the martial way and fulfill your duties without fault throughout your life. There are a few historic details which need to be understood to put Hagakure into its proper historic context. First, while the text was written in 1716, it did not see widespread dissemination outside the saga domain. This was because the text was critical of both the contemporary head of the domain as well as the Tokugawa Bakufu. As such, the text was considered a secret text and was not published outside the saga domain until 1906, and a full translation was not made widely available until 29 years later. The second important note is that the text was initially rejected by Inoue Tetsujiro when he was developing his Bushido canon. Even though Jocho was one of the few authors writing in the Edo period to actually use the term Bushido in some of his writing, Inoue felt Hagakure 
was too regionally specific to be of any use. Its current popularity among Western samurai enthusiasts comes primarily from two things. The first was from its popular association with author Mishima Yukio, an ultra-right-wing nationalist who most famously committed seppuku on November 25, 1970, after a failed coup attempt to restore the Showa Emperor. The second is owing to the heroic efforts of the Shambhala and Tuttle publishing houses, who capitalized on a wave of Japanophilia in North America following the so-called Japanese economic miracle, when corporations and self-help gurus alike tried to plumb the depths of classic Japanese texts associated with samurai to discover some seeker to explain Japan's success. Conclusion So I want you to watch this clip I showed you earlier once more and see if the way you feel about it has changed. You have seen many things. I have. You do not fear death, but sometimes you wish for it. Is this not so? Yes, I hope so. It happens to men who have seen what we have seen. And then, I come to this place of my ancestors and I remember like these blossoms we are all dying to know life in every breath every cup of tea every life we take the way of the warrior life in every breath that is so, the 2003 film, The Last Samurai, is an important film in contemporary samurai film canon, particularly as it was an American production. Now, 2003 may seem like aeons ago today, but it was the last critically acclaimed and popular film representing samurai in a realistic historic setting. Film is an incredibly pervasive means through which general audiences experience history. And so, The Last Samurai stands for a singular Western take on a historic event from Japanese history made for Western audiences. As the clip shows, the film is heavily invested in the idealized romantic version of the samurai, which was, ironically, by the film's chronology, to occur almost a decade after the fictionalized version of the historic events depicted take place. But historic misrepresentation is not limited to film alone. A wide swath of popular history texts written about the samurai, as well as a not inconsiderable number of academic surveys and even monographs, assert the assumed historicity of Bushido and rely on it to provide cultural context to the behaviors and actions of historic individuals and groups. This isn't limited to Western audiences either. The Last Samurai was widely popular when it was released in Japan, because it fits the established modern narrative of Bushido established during the Meiji era. Romantic representations are powerful, but Uncritical acceptance of these representations as adhering to historic fidelity can then lead to audiences, readers, and enthusiasts alike to developing a distorted understanding of the historic reality of individual figures, samurai, and medieval and early modern Japanese history in general. Bushido is an incredibly broad topic, and while I have done my best to provide a crash course in the time given, if you want to know more, or want some good translations of some of the texts I've mentioned, I would highly recommend the works of Alexander Bennett. For the more academically minded, Inventing the Way of the Samurai by Oleg Bench is THE authoritative text on the development of Bushido in modern Japan. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you are interested in topics like these, and want to hear me yammer some more, I have a YouTube channel. Or you can follow me on Twitter, at Study of Swords, especially if you have any follow-up questions. 
Thank you very much to Anime North for allowing me to participate in Momiji's online experience, and I hope you all enjoy the rest of the event. Thanks for your time.